The operator of the Fukushima Daiichi has opened the central control room of the facilities number one and two reactors to the media for the first time since the 2011 accident. The room shows signs that workers on duty that day struggled in the dark. On March 14th, three days after the earthquake, a hydrogen explosion blew apart the building that housed reactor number three. The strong shock reached reactor number two as well. Darkness surrounded operators wearing masks and protective suits. Reactor number two's cooling system was still operational at this point. to get the power back on. The central control room, located near next to the reactor buildings, is where workers struggle to contain the crisis three years ago amid rising radiation levels. <laughs> Venting was the last resort, and it was failing. The unimaginable was happening. Another explosion has been heard at the Fukushima number no. one power plant. The blast was heard around 6 a.m. Japan time on Tuesday, coming from the number no. two reactor. At the Fukushima number no. one nuclear power plant, number two reactor, at 6.14 a.m., uh, there was a blast heard near the suppression pool, and the uh, pressure began to fall in the uh, suppression pool. We are continuing the uh, water injection into the pressure of those vessels, but uh, the operators who are not directly engaged in this operation are being uh, ordered to be evacuated to safer locations. The workers at the plant felt that, without the proper support, preventing a meltdown was impossible. Things that we needed the most didn't come at all. Really, what would you expect us to do under such circumstances? I know I shouldn't speak like this, but that's how we felt. People may say the explosion could have been avoided if we had this or that. Well, I'm afraid there's no end to such hypothetical arguments. Japan lacked a system to deliver necessities to nuclear plants contaminated with radiation. Radiation in the room just after the accident measured one millisievert per hour. Due to decontamination efforts, the level has since fallen to less than one one hundred fiftieth of that figure. Numbers were scribbled on a wall next to a water gauge. It suggests how staff trying to, con trying to monitor the amount of water inside the reactors couldn't write the figures down on paper in the darkness. A hydrogen explosion that occurred soon after the tsunami struck blew panels off the ceiling. Lighting fixtures remain exposed. The governing parties have just started to discuss a new basic uh, energy plan for the country, but there are still many unanswered questions over Fukushima. In particular, it's still unclear why the workers couldn't properly vent off the pressure inside the containment vessel at reactor number two. No clear picture has yet emerged of where and how the reactor and containment vessel were damaged and why so many radioactive materials managed to escape.
旅の途中の知らない街でよみがえる記憶がなぜか少し切ない。Oh my h o m こんな街まで同じ道をたどっては。戻ることはできない。Oh sweet home。だけどそこにいて、私がまた帰る。This is Democracy Now. Democracy Now. dot org. The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We end today's show with nuclear news from both Japan and the United States. Japan's just announced a major push to revive its nuclear energy program just weeks before the third anniversary of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear meltdown. This comes just a week after it was revealed about a hundred tons of highly radioactive water had leaked from one of the hundreds of storage tanks at the Fukushima nuclear power plant. Here in the United States, the Obama administration announced last week. It approved $6.5 billion in loan guarantees to back construction of the country's first new nuclear power plant in more than 30 years. This comes as a nuclear waste disposal site is said to reopen near Carlsbad, New Mexico, following an unexplained leak of radioactive material that occurred on February 14th. The underground waste dump was shut down after an air monitor detected radioactive contamination. On Monday, federal regulators reported slightly elevated levels of airborne radioactive. Activity, but said they didn't pose a threat to the public. For more, we're joined by the co-authors of the new book *Fukushima: The Story of a Nuclear Disaster*. Edwin Lyman is one of the country's leading experts on nuclear power safety and security, and a senior global security scientist with the Union of Concerned Scientists. Susan Stranahan is with us. She's covered nuclear energy issues since she was the lead reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer's coverage of the Three Mile Island accident, which was awarded a Pulitzer Prize.、Um, we're going to begin with. Edwin Lyman,、um, talk about these parallel nuclear developments. Japan, with its conservative、uh, prime minister Shinzo Abe, despite the polls showing overwhelming opposition to anti-nuclear, to to growth of nuclear power reliance, is announcing upping this, and the United States is also moving in this direction. Well, I think these are both symptoms of the same phenomenon, which is the complacency. Uh, about the nuclear industry and its dangers that was prevalent before Fukushima and is still uh, in, in, uh, still exists today. So we have Japan, the new government, which is hoping that the people will eventually forget about the crisis that they went through, so that they can restart the 50 nuclear power plants that were shut down after the accident. In the United States, we have、uh, the government's. All of the above energy policy, which includes、uh, more government subsidies for nuclear power, and we're very concerned that if these efforts go forward without taking all the lessons of Fukushima into account, that we're setting up a, a, a potential、What、disaster. What are those lessons? Well, the main lesson is you have to accept the fact that any nuclear power plant is going to be vulnerable to a large natural disaster, and that there's no way to completely eliminate the dangers of nuclear power. There are steps you can take to reduce the risk, but we're afraid that here in the United States, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is, and the industry are not going as far as they need to go to really reduce the risk to the,、uh, the American people. What are the stories, Susan Stranahan, that this country is missing? You were、um, the lead reporter on the coverage of Three Mile Island. Young people weren't even born who are watching or listening to the show right now. They might not even know what Three Mile Island is. Well, I think the the, the parallels from Three Mile Island in '79 and Fukushima are that. The industry regulators and the American public were not prepared for what happened, and what we point out in the book is that it's been 35 years since Three Mile Island, <clears throat> and fundamental lessons remain unlearned, and fundamental. Mindsets exist that were prevalent in 1979 are prevalent today, and as Ed said, we haven't learned the lessons from Fukushima. We need to learn those 
and then move forward. And explain what the lessons from Three Mile Island and Fukushima are. Well, I think it's what it's what we point out in the book is that there is just a general assumption that nuclear power is safe and we don't need to add on an extra layer for the unexpected. As we say in the book, they've set the safety bar at X but have refused to ask what if X plus one happens. Ed Lyman, what most shocked you when you were doing research for this book? Well, uh, being in Washington for a long time, very little shocks me, but I could say that um, while the government, while the U.S. government was telling the American people there was nothing to fear from Fukushima and that U.S. plants aren't vulnerable to the same problems, internally they were, they, uh, there was a much different story. So we've learned from a lot of Freedom of Information Act uh, documents that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the White House, were actually very concerned about the potential impact of radiation from Fukushima affecting not only Americans in Tokyo, which was uh, more than 100 miles away from the plant, but also Americans in the West Coast. And they were furiously running calculations to try to figure out how bad it could get. But there was no sense of this in, the, in what they were telling the public. But So Americans were telling Americans, it, the U.S. government was telling Americans in Japan to leave much quicker than the Japanese government was. I just, we just came from Tokyo. We yeah. broadcast for three days from Japan. And we're going to play the interview I did with the former prime minister, the one in charge at the time, Naoto Kan. He said it was extremely difficult to get a straight answer from TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric Power Company that ran the plants, and he had to fly in. He figured the only place he could get a straight, non-political answer, he flew in the middle of the night to the plant to talk to the workers to figure out whether he had to evacuate 50 million people in Tokyo. Yes, well, there was the general panic because the utility, nuclear power, was a huge part of its profile, and they wanted to do everything they could to stabilize the accident so they didn't have to tell the rest of the world that they were failing. And so there was a lack of transparency, which is persisting to this day and hampering the cleanup efforts. The human stories that you followed, Susan? I think that um, what we have always um, missed in the nuclear debate is the human side, the face of a disaster. And that's what um, I hope to portray by my contribution. Ed and our co-author, Dave Lockbaum, are nuclear safety experts. I'm a journalist, and I tended to see the opportunity to put a human face on a nuclear disaster. So we portray um, what happened to the people in Japan, uh, the disruptions in their lives, the economic consequences, and a lot of the political backstory into how we got where we are today. This uh, leak that took place in New Mexico on Valentine's Day, on February 14th, uh, this is right near Carlsbad, New Mexico, at the WIP facility. Explain what that is and why you're concerned about it. Government officials say, don't be concerned. Well, WIP is, a, is the only operating geologic repository for nuclear waste in the U.S., and it's where the Department of Energy sends waste that's contaminated with isotopes of plutonium that have very long half-lives and are very toxic. So there's a lot of garbage from the legacy of making nuclear weapons that's contaminated with plutonium, and that is essentially put into 55-gallon waste drums and loaded into this uh, salt, salt mine. And the leak, no one really knows the origin, but they've detected plutonium and americium actually outside in the, uh, of the facility. And so they have to figure out exactly where it's where it came from, and no one knows. And now this has been touted as such a safe facility that New Mexico, this area, could become a, dep a depository for much more um, nuclear waste that might alarm many in New Mexico. Right. The local boosters want to keep it going, and so they're searching the country for more waste to put in it. But this issue, uh, depending on how it plays out, could uh, could put a monkey wrench in those plans. I want to thank you both for being with us. Congratulations on your new book, Fukushima, The Story of a Nuclear Disaster, the co-authors Edwin Lyman and Susan Stranahan.